so good afternoon and thanks everyone for braving the snow to get here. Um, we're honored. We have a we're honored to have a tag team of two of our EOL staff for giving today's EOL seminar. Mike Daniels, the head of our CDS Computing Data and Software. Computing Data and Software. Uh, and Charlie Martin, who's also in the group. And Charlie's distinguished by having this year received our the NCAR UCAR Outstanding Achievement Award. Um, your number six in all of UCAR or something like that? That's not handed out very often. I wasn't counting. Something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, they'll be talking to us about um, new ways to collect data. Real time. And uh, so I'll just go ahead and start. Thanks, Steve. <coughs> okay. Um, first thing I want to say is. Uh, I'm the principal investigator of this uh, award. It's an EarthCube award, and so this is the team. You know, these are the team members. So I'm representing the work of all these uh, uh, great uh, team members we have. Um, so with that, uh, the CORD stands for Cloud Hosted Real Time Data Services for the Geosciences. And so hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll understand what that means. Um, you know, real time data is uh, critical and, and growing importance. Uh, we we know that very well in the observational community. Um, you know, there there are real time uh, measurements of flood waters, um, tweets, uh, real time tweets that describe uh, hazardous events, and then of course in EOL we do a lot of these uh, field experiments where we're, you know, trying to um, observe a, a dynamically changing phenomenon, and we have aircraft, we have radars, we have uh, surface instrumentation that we're trying to coordinate around that storm to you know, to take the very best measurements, and of course real time data is really key to that. We need to you know, get a, a good uh, uh, picture of the situation in order to um, uh, you know, assess it. Same thing happens in the oceanography community, for example. So there are kind of episodic real-time events, like our field programs, and there's this sort of measurement of the ambient uh, condition um, and uh, you know, to detect events that occur. So I don't know how many folks know about this, but there's this concept of the Internet of Things. It's essentially saying that uh, every many, many more devices are going to be connected to the Internet in the future. Um, you know, your watch, your phone. Um, I'm a fisherman. I, I, I decided to replace my 14-year-old uh, fish finder, and it has an Internet connection, and it uses it to, you know, uh, to, to download maps and to send position data to a crowdsourced map. So um, this notion that many, many more things are going to be connected to the Internet is is what one thing that's driving uh, the importance of real time data, but of course uh, watches and and not everything can be used by the geosciences community. So we're really focused on geosciences things, um, and that that might be uh, you know a, a surprising uh, area. You know things might pop up in in areas that you may not expect. For example, we were at the AGU last uh, December, and there's a, a fellow at Berkeley developing an application called MyQuake. You know the gaming community is is developing accelerometers and really fancy uh, capabilities in these phones, but they can actu actually also be used for things like detecting earthquakes and trying to you know help put those uh, data into a, another crowdsourced model to predict where they'll go. So I think that uh, the Internet of Things is going to change the way we think about um, uh, the everyday devices that might be connected to the internet. Dan. So crowdsourced usually means that, that people are funding it. Um, you mean now crowdsourcing? Data. Exactly. Yeah. Um, in this in this particular case, the application called MyQuake runs on your phone in the background and and reports data. So you do have to have uh, you know ha have that app installed and running. In fact, he told me that one of the early uh, designs of this uh, 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 had had challenges in terms of the battery consumption. So I'm not saying these are easy uh, you know, problems, but it is a different domain. You know, with all of these devices uh, connected to the internet. Um, so EarthCube in about 2012 decided to do domain workshops. So geosciences domains being ocean, you know, the oceans, the hydrology, atmosphere, uh, earth, solid earth sciences. And um, Vonda and uh, NSF uh, you know, asked what, uh, what workshop uh, might be appropriate for our domain, you know, the atmospheric sciences domain. And I decided to think about it a little bit differently in terms of a technical domain that I thought could cross geosciences. So we uh, got funded to put on a workshop to, for uh, real-time data in uh, June of 2013. It was about 70 to 80 folks around the geosciences that came and gave us their ideas, their projects, and uh, we generated a report. Um, some of the highlights from that report are that th there needs to be improved community infrastructure. Everything from communications from the sensors to the, to the internet to uh, on-demand computing and protocols for data exchange. Um, 
there was very little metadata being generated for these streams. They just sort of popped in and, and you sampled them and displayed them and, and there was no tracking of the provenance of where these uh, data came from and you know, metadata describing the measurements in more detail. Um, the, the community felt that we needed tools to integrate um, and display these data from differing time and uh, space domains. You know, things are coming at very different rates in very different parts of the world, and um, to have one infrastructure that could kind of assimilate that and, and uh, you know, use that in, a, in an effective way was something the community needed. And then um, along with real-time data comes the actual control of the instrumentation at times. So uh, in our case, we have an aircraft flying, and uh, we, I wouldn't say control is the right word, but guidance to, you know, to, to where the aircraft flies is another important aspect of real-time data. And of course, in, um, in many sensors, that can be done in an automated way, and, and EOL has examples of that as well. And then we want to integrate some of these real-time uh, data with uh, you know, the folks that are actually uh, doing emergency management. Um, an example I heard of in, um, an inter at the ESIP meeting in January, uh, we're using UAVs you know, to do a sort of a, a photographic survey of damaged areas to try to help the emergency managers target you know, the areas that really needed attention and ignore others uh, that looked okay. So um, that's a real a strong connection in terms of uh, hazards and, and things like that. And then um, the whole area of social media, apps, um, and crowdsourcing was another um, uh, identified need from this uh, community. As I was saying, you're going to have you know, there are many more devices that are going to be connected to the internet in the future. So that's the summary, that's some of the highlights of that report. It's all available online. I'd be happy to share that with you. Um, and as a result of that workshop. Um, we uh, submitted a uh, building block proposal in EarthCube. Now, EarthCube, if you don't know, it's an initiative that uh, covers the geosciences. They have uh, both building blocks and then um, what are called research coordination networks, which are more like workshops you know, to gather feedback. Building blocks are actual tools or prototype tools. And so we submitted a, a proposal in 2014 with these um, uh, areas. Um, you know, we, we, we identified that uh, real-time data has some unique challenges compared to the retrospective data, and it's really important to get it right the f you know, as you do the sampling, because otherwise, you know, the data downstream is uh, of, of lim limited use unless you, you know, take very good measurements in the front, front end. Um, we, w we wanted to use a cloud-based infrastructure uh, for this, and we, we uh, understood that there are many real-time systems around the, in the geosciences. EOL has some. There's an IRIS uh, group that does uh, seismic sensors. Uh, an oceanography group uh, also uh, has uh, sensors on ships. And so in those cases, we would fork those streams, you know, stay, stay going. The data would stream to their existing systems, but then would fork to cords so that it could be accessible by a broader community, um, you know, less overhead and, and a simpler access. And um, one of the things we decided to propose is using uh, some standards. This Open Geospatial Consortium has a whole standard directed at sensor webs, they're called, so these webs of sensors, and um, you know, connect some of our streams to those standards, and that would provide some metadata, make those data more useful. That was part of our um, initial proposal. And then um, one, one thing that we hear from our scientists here is they would like to get access to our real-time streams to actually do algorithm uh, you know, algorithms, you know, compute, let's say, the next trajectory of an aircraft or where to send the, um, the uh, uh, vehicles that are uh, chasing storms. And so um, that, you know, the scientist community would want access to the real-time data in order to put, you know, connect those to their own algorithms. And then as the EarthCube community developed, it had several building blocks. Some of them you know, d dealt with models. Um, others were you know, post-distribution. Um, others were like discovery. So we wanted to connect real-time data to those services so that you, a, a person could discover the sources of real-time data that uh, are available through, you know, through the CORDS mechanism in the geosciences community. And then there, there's a fair amount of work being done in this adaptive sampling area where, um, as I was mentioning before, you um, can control the instrumentation based on the inputs that you're receiving. So, um, you know, doing this in sort of an automated way, and I'll give you one use case for that. And then finally, um, you know, connecting these streams to these decision support um, systems and, uh, uh, you know, making, the, making them very diverse. So these are the main topics of our 2014 uh, proposal. Um, 
the partners that we chose to work with. Uh, Chandra is a research scientist uh, and engineer at uh, CSU. He's doing um, a, a project down in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, they, they have these radars that are very small. They fit on cell phone towers. They're called CASA, uh, part of the CASA network. And so their um, project is to estimate the precipitation in a cloud and, um, and then send those estimates to the downstream hydrologists who will then predict what, what areas will flood. So he had a lot of um, uh, uh, exposure and experience with adaptive sampling because these small radars actually track the storm as it moves. And you know, so they'll, they'll point in the direction of the storm and then another uh, network of these will take over. So he had quite a bit of experience in that area. Um, we also um, had, has a partner, um, Bronco Kirkez. He is uh, working in a, in a group in Michigan. Um, he's, uh, he just finished his PhD. It's a small group. It's him and uh, a couple uh, uh, research assistants. They're doing adaptive sampling with uh, water quality uh, me measurements. And so um, one of the issues, one of the challenges with these water quality instruments is um, they're they're solar powered, so they 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 have to have to be careful with their power consumption, and and actually um, they they routinely sort of do sort of a slow sampling um, uh, rate to to sort of save on power, but when the when an event comes, a flood event comes or something like that, they want to sample much quicker. So what what he's actually developed is something that goes to weather underground to get forecasts to tell his instrumentation you know in these streams to start sampling faster. So he had experience in this adaptive sampling area. And he's also an early career researcher, so he was um, uh, brought in as a partner. Frank Vernon is uh, uh, is part of this EarthScope project. Um, these are seismic arrays that um, are are moved across the United States. Uh, so he had the solid Earth experience. He also had a, a real time system already in place that we could use as a as a test bed for forking uh, data into cords. So that was uh, his contribution to the project. <coughs> And then we had the UAH group, who was, you know, very um, engaged with this sensor web enablement uh, uh, system, and uh, connected to many of these other uh, end user tasks. Um, and so they were uh, uh, enlisted as a partner as well. They they had uh, the experience with this Open Geospatial Consortium standards, for example. Here in EOL, um, our contribution, you know, this is an example of what we uh, what we show in the field. You know, it's a situational awareness display of aircraft. Um, we have the video, live video coming down from the aircraft during missions. We have satellite data, radar data overlaid with the tracks, in term, and we use this to guide the, the missions. One thing about this display, there's a lot of capability. We have a lot of different overlays that can be added, including models. Um, but the data itself, the streaming data the, from the aircraft is not accessible through this display. It's more um, you know, like a closed circuit TV that you can watch and you can configure, but the actual data are not accessible through this. And so that was one, one need that we had um, in, in this project. So we, we uh, wrote up a couple geoscience use cases. One of them is uh, evaporation, evaporation of water and, and um, assessment of its quality in the Great Lakes region. So this would be uh, you know a project that would have hydrology instruments needed, um, an aircraft that would measure evaporative fluxes across the lake, um, buoys that were in in the uh, in the lake itself. And so it was a nice case of uh, geosciences, uh, re you know, real time data measurements that would help uh, uh, the scientists understand this problem. Another uh, use case was uh, in the seismic area. Uh, about 2011, Frank Vernon came and talked to us about um, the, uh, the the time when they had the EarthScope network out in a, in, a, in the uh, Midwest, and they actually saw a signature from a tornado from these seismic sensors. So that's not something that our atmospheric science community thinks about much, but uh, there's some you know, there's some interesting uh, you know data and use cases that can be developed from that fact. And so um, he, he gave a talk about that uh, signature, and could those sensors be something that our atmospheric science uh, you know, researchers use? And this is atmospheric pressure, Mike? Yeah, it was pressure. Mm -hmm. you know, they, were, they were measuring seismic. Right, and, and, but they also have um, you know, the, 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 the state parameter pressure uh, you know, data as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, they, they have meteorology, little meteorology stations that we could, you know, you know tap into. Uh, and, and in fact, they had a lot of questions about about the instrumentation that we use, uh, you know, to help improve their quality. So um, we did submit the proposal, um, but uh, we had uh, we, we got approval for a scaled back version. Um, 
it's uh, essentially what we what we decided to focus on instead is just expo exposing this concept to the broader geosciences community that you can actually develop a common you know real time data system that could apply to a lot of instrumentation uh, across the geosciences. Um, we were we were starting uh, we, we proposed to start ad adapting and testing some diverse real time streams beyond just atmospheric science sensors, um, and then we would test this open geospatial consortium uh, SWE infrastructure with these streams. And um, then, then one other part of the, our proposal is that we would we connect our streams where possible to these other existing building blocks and as part of the EarthCube um, e ecosystem. So we began by you know focusing on these very small measurement teams. As I mentioned here on the on the left, Bronco Kerkez is a is a recent uh, PhD uh, graduate. He has uh, three research assistants, and um, you know they don't have a, a lot of resources, but they're they're pretty good at at the uh, measurements that they're taking. Uh, they're good at building instrumentation. A more recent um, group that we're working with is this uh, group here at NCAR and RAL and, and JAS who are developing these uh, weather stations that are printed with a 3D printer. All these components are, are printed with a 3D printer and they use Raspberry Pi computers to do the sampling of, of the data. You, know, you can get a, a weather station like this for two to three hundred dollars and their objective is to put these in developing countries um, you know, as a very inexpensive way of getting some meteorological information. But again, it's a small team with not a lot of resources for the, um, you know, for the downstream uses of their data. So we started by focusing on these uh, kind, of, uh, kind of users. And you know the characteristics of these users is, is that generally they're experts in in their uh, unique measurements. Um, they're they're frequently looking for funding you know, to keep the programs uh, going. Um, they're really not able to focus on this complex standards uh, and uh, OGC infrastructure and things like that. They're really focused on the measurements, and so they don't have time to uh, you know deal with uh, the, these complicated uh, documents and standards. Um, and they really lack resources to spend on uh, on expansive hardware and software. They're really Really focused on acquiring the data, um, but of course they'd, they'd likely see you know, benefit of the more, more more use of their data. So that's the the nice uh, the part that we can add with courts is to expose their data to a broader community. So um, here's the general model for courts. What we just, what we had come up with. Um, you would go to something like the Amazon Web Services, a cloud provider. You'd see a little acronym. That I had to paste this in, but this is our vision. Um, an acronym for CORDS, you know, getting your own CORDS instance. You would uh, you know, download that instance. It would be running in the Amazon uh, Web Service. Uh, it actually fits in what's called a micro instance, which is uh, free for the first year. After that, it's 50 cents a day. Is that right? So very inexpensive. They don't have to go to their IT department to ask for resources or create a virtual machine. They just do it on the cloud. <clears throat> they configure their own portal with their instrumentation, you know, describe it, um, add as many uh, sites as they want, and then um, start you know, getting their, their data coming in. So that's the, the three-step process. And actually, it turns out, obviously, there are steps in between each one of these. And the first one to get the Amazon instance is about eight steps. Is that right? Something like that. And then, um, similarly, when they configure their instrument, they have to type in information about what they're measuring, the variables, and that kind of thing. And then uh, they get their uh, courts portal. So that's the basic concept. <clears throat> A couple of the reasons that we decided to use the cloud and virtualized servers is scalability. You know, if you have a, a very large network, you you can scale that up very easily. Everybody knows that's one of the benefits of the cloud. Um, and and um, you know, the, the you don't have to access your uh, friendly ID, IT department. It's your instance. You can you know configure it at you know, at your own will. Um, the the basically the the cloud services are ubiquitous. They're all over, and so um, it's something that uh, yeah, you know is, is very common and, and and will be commonly used. And then there's this notion of DevOps, where the developers are also like the sysadmins, you know, for the uh, for these um, systems, and that makes um, the the cloud services makes that very um, easy to do. It's uh, easy to deploy software in the in the cloud, which is what one thing we found out. And then um, these development environments can be generic enough to work on on many different uh, cloud providers. It's pretty agnostic to what cloud provider we we we, um, we would use, and and then that makes the software uh, easier to install on, on on many different systems. So when you're um, when you've got your core instance going, uh, the next thing you want to do is start sending data to it. And so we've given a couple um, examples in um, in Python and in WGET. Um, but it is as simple as typing a, a web address with the the variables and the values in your web browser. 
and of course m uh, most uh, scripting languages can can uh, send uh, an HTTP request. I'll break that request down a little bit so you can see wh what I'm talking about. Um, you know that that first uh, host name is your portal address. Um, you have an instrument ID, you know, if you have several instruments at your site. And then you know, the wind direction is uh, 121, the wind speed is 21.4. Those are the actual values that, uh, that uh, you're inputting into the system. So you type this into your browser and you've just entered one point into the system. So you know, what, would you, what you do is connect that up to your sensors, have it start spitting out HTTP uh, requests each second or each uh, some period of time. And, um, and that's very simple for, for folks to do. You know, this is how you get your, your, your uh, data into the system. Yeah, you, um, and, and in fact, um, we have uh, we have quite a bit of experience with communications, but that can often be the weak link. You know, weak link. If you don't have cell phone coverage, uh, or you know, or something like that. But of course, you you you, you could use a, a satellite uh, connection if you want. So um, yeah, we do assume that there's some basic data communications uh, capability. And in fact, I think we've helped help them understand uh, uh, what what's available in in some of our uh, some of those cases. But yeah, you do have to have a basic internet. You have to have a connection to the internet. What do you want to say, Charlie? Yeah. Running software, and as Mike was saying uh, in the previous slide, you have a little Python script that does that. Can you go back to that slide? Sure. That just does that. You see those three lines of code? The red. So you have to write a little bit of code to do so that. you provide help with that code? Yeah. yeah. Well, you have examples on the website. Okay. Yeah. Um, but that is a good question. You have to have basic connectivity. Yep. So Dan. Um, this key, I don't know whether that's. Oh, okay. Sure, mention um, that. Authentication. They are related, actually. Yeah. Um, one one uh, one issue is if you just had the URL, um, then anybody could send you know, you know a point uh, to to your Quartz portal, and so the key is is a security you know, mechanism, a unique key you know for your portal that you have to include. Um, we we just scratched the surface at security, <laughs> but but we did build in some, and we know that that's going to be uh, you know something that we want to expand. Yeah. It is. Yeah, exactly. And that's uh, that's part of uh, one of the things we had to do in the scale back version. We you know we wanted to do more spatial data, but in the scale back version, we focused more on the time series uh, data. Thanks for that question. Um, so we came up with this idea on our own. We thought we were pretty smart, and uh, we were you know in the project. And uh, lo and behold, there are tons of companies that are actually doing this. They're they're really working on it from the perspective of the Internet of Things, you know, the toasters and you know, who knows what else. Um, and so, but there are pr plenty of these you know, you know around um, to, to highlight sort of the distinguishing features between uh, us and and them. Uh, uh, these commercial uh, groups is the portal is completely owned and managed by the science team. Um, these other services, you know, they have a server that you send your data to, and yeah, we'll give you your data. So they like to centralize, uh, you know, the, the, the services, um, and and you know, our, and, and ours really lends itself to being in a distributed network model and not a monolithic server. Um, we're not. We're, our software is on GitHub. It's open source, so it's not tied to one uh, vendor or company. Um, there's no monthly fee other than this fee I told you about for the hosting of the portal itself, which is around 50 cents a day after after a year. Um, it's an open source project, so you can actually download the source and add some new capability if you want to. Um, and then it implements uh, OGC standards, which are really important from the geosciences community. There's this thing called sensor ML, which basically describes a sensor. It's just an, an XML object that describes a sensor, and cords will output uh, uh, that information so that uh, it can be registered as a, as, a, as a sensor that's available for the geosciences community. And then, of course, we're connected to all of this infrastructure that EarthCube brings in terms of um, you know, exposing all the real-time data sources in the geosciences and that sort of thing. So we're really focused on geosciences and really the academic kind of environment. Uh, so we're, that distinguishes us from these commercial outfits. And with that, I'll have Charlie do a demo. So can, oh, I'm sorry. Yes? A um, couple questions. Um, data storage on the back end. Mm -hmm. how Very good question. Um, we have we have a uh, the portal each portal has a database running um and it has limitations on the number of points that, you know, that it can accept it's a million no or is that more now no, no more, than more than that, that now 
Um, but uh, so so what, we're not an archive. You know, it's not an archiving system. But that has been a common request to somehow connect this to something that's also uh, re recording an archive. Um, and so uh, on the on the database limitations, we sort of flush the database uh, periodically and then start over. So it is a, a, an existing limitation. Yeah. Yeah, so the portal has uh, logins, logins and passwords. So, um, you know, that, that, that's all, again within the control of the team. They, they you know, we, they, we give them a default admin account and then they can add as many as they want after that. Yep. I'm just curious, the 50 cents a day that you're mentioning for the micro instance, yeah. that, that's just the instance that's not the bandwidth. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, for the kind of data we have here, our bandwidth is in the noise compared to what Amazon wants to charge you for. When, when you do the cost, the estimate, the cost estimates on Amazon, that doesn't show up. It's bandwidth going out, not in, right? Yeah, <clears throat> that's a good point. I'll help you, Eric. <laughs> yeah, it's cheap to get it in. Then you try to pull it out. Yeah. Yeah, well, but it's still really small. I mean, for the kind of use case that we're looking at, that I don't think would be an issue at this time. And the other thing I'd say is, um, we're not. I mean, it's open source and it's contained. It's it's a package that can be moved to another cloud service or even a virtual server. So there's nothing in the architecture that prevents it from running, you know, in other places. If that be, were to become an issue. No, I, 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 I'm, we're headed that way. Yeah, we're headed that way, but we don't at this time. Okay, so I'll let Charlie do a demo so you can okay. understand. Thanks, Mike. That was a, a great uh, description of the project. Um, I, I wanted to emphasize, too, that Mike told you about our initial vision and proposal and then the fact that we really got seed funding for this project. And it, it really has had maybe six man months of effort to get to this prototype demonstration. Um, we know that there are lots of capabilities that we want to, to um, improve on and, and add to it. So. Uh, but but the idea is out there and, and being productively used by um, by some of our friendly testers. Um, this we have a nice website which describes the whole uh, system and and how to get started with it. Uh, it's called Cords RT Cords Real Time dot com, which actually goes to, to GitHub, and um, it uh, this website is is a good place to 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 get an idea of of how the project works and. Um, get ideas about how you would um, spin up your own portal and so on. Mike was talking about the steps that you use on Amazon to, to create a portal and, and it really, I've got um, eight steps here but most of them are just click-throughs. So it's really pretty easy to do. And w once you get a portal configured, so this would be your own instance that you've created on Amazon, then you can go to the new uh, website that it has created. It's created both a web server and a database connected with this. Um, it's built on uh, Ruby on Rails. And uh, you'd log into that. And this is what the, the front page of a portal looks like. We call it the dashboard. This is kind of the default place to go, take a look at what your portal is doing. And this gives you different um, uh, time span display of um, measurements, the number of measurements that have been coming in from your instruments. And the uh, the idea is, at, at a glance, you can tell if things are, are working or not. This is not the data itself, but just the number of measurements that, that you've gotten. Um, this is uh, kind of our test bed portal that we're putting some, uh, we've got the three NCAR weather stations going into it, plus the weather station in my house. and. Um, it, it gives you an opportunity to kind of look look around. So, the um, uh, the dashboard is really the first place that one goes to look and see how how things are doing. Ma Mike mentioned that all of the data goes in via URLs. The green banner up here at the top shows you the most recent URL that's come in with data. It's just sort of a sanity check to see how um, uh, if your system's working. Let me get myself logged in here. And uh, the advantage of a login is that uh, then you have uh, administrative um, 
access to the site. Never. Okay, so uh, now that I'm logged in as a uh, as an administrator, I've got more access. There are more options on the left side here. Um, we have just a few kind of concepts um, uh, in the system. There are, are sites, which are places that you will have instruments. Here's a listing of sites. Bigger. Okay, I can do that. How's that? Is that good? More? More? To low resolution projector sign. Okay, good. Um, so here's here's a listing of sites, and um, it, it's very dynamic at this point because I'm an administrator logged in as one. I could I could add a new site here, create a new site, and um, here's a kind of visual map of of the sites that we've got running right now. There's the uh, um, Wyoming supercomputer there. Um, once you've got sites set up, you can define the instruments, and uh, this is the list of the instruments that are coming in, and some some data about how many measurements we've gotten uh, total on the sites, and for each instrument, you can go then and, and configure that. Um, this gives you some information about it, and you see here, this is the uh, the area where you will define what data streams are going to come in. You define a short name, V1, for instance, um, is going to be what's in the URL that comes in. If we go back here, you can see the most recent URL that came in for this instrument. There's V1 equals 9.1, V2 is equal to 80, and so on. And they mean they mean different things. Um, I'm going to go back to the to the list of instruments, and we'll take a Look at one that has variables that make more sense. So here you go. This is a, a weather station at, at Foothills Lab. Um, and you can see the short names that were assigned to the variables. And finally, there's a, a graph at the bottom that lets you take a kind of a look at your data and see if, if things are are um, looking reasonable or not. This is just a standard web uh, component, graphing component from high charts, and it'll update um, automatically. One of the um, nice features we've got is that when a research group is setting up uh, a portal like this, um, they can um, run a simulator and uh, for all the instruments you've made it, it gives you the simulation capability. If I hit this button right here um, it would start sending simulated data to the portal so you can it'll start sending simulated URLs and uh, that way you can test everything even before you put an instrument out in the field to make sure your portal seems to be configured properly. So that that's a really useful. Um, let's talk a little bit about getting data out of the portal. There's a real simple interface for for grabbing um, data in different formats uh, like um, for the Foothills Weather Station I'll go get the CSV data for the last day. Did it run Excel? There you go. So that's the uh, that's the data that came uh, for the last day. And you could you could choose different days. Um, the function of trimming the database. Um, Mike talked about if the database gets too big, um, uh, the infrastructure doesn't handle it very well in these small instrument um, instances. So. Um, it's looking like about three million measurements is what works on our micro instance right now with um, giving us a good enough response time. Uh, there are also on the web pages uh, a little bit of documentation about building these URLs that you would use. So you can go over here and you can see this is an example of the kind of URL that you would use to put data into the into the portal and this is how you might get data out of it. And uh, let's just try one of these. I take this URL and I'm just going to paste that into my browser. And there's the last data point that we, re we received. So you can do that from browsers, but you can also put those kind of URLs into your code. So you could um, be writing MATLAB, uh, Python, R, any kind of programming language you want to shell scripting 
Uh, you could write web pages which issue these URLs and grab data for whatever your application is. So envision that um, a small science team, let's say a, a graduate department, uh, has got a project going somewhere and uh, the graduate students could put together all sorts of scripts and um, activities that could be monitoring and producing um, analyses and so on um, tailored to their kind of research. This portal uh, here is, uh, as I said, is kind of the test bed that we're using. Uh, we have about half a dozen portals going now with friendly users. Here's another one. This is the uh, 3D weather station, printed weather station, that um, the RAL folks are, are using it for. And um, it really was a very um, uh, convenient uh, collaboration with them. They, they had the weather station that they wanted to put out in the field. Their workflow model was that someone would go out in Namibia or Zambia every month and plug a USB stick into it. And we said, well, why not just do it in real time? Um, cell phone is everywhere in Africa. And um, that was a great match for them because now their instruments can go um, online um, autom automatically. They can get um, exposure and, and distribution of this data uh, immediately. So uh, we've been really excited about working with this crowd. So I think that's about all I've got to show you. Do you have any questions? Jeff? What's your, what's your uh, data rate? So uh, right now, um, it's more governed by how big the database is going to get. You could put data in at a one, sort of at a one second rate if you wanted, but. But, but like for atmospheric turbulence, you want to do like 25 hertz. Right, no, that, that would overwhelm the system right now. Right now, our database is, has one row for each measurement, and um, we, we'd like to uh, improve the capabilities the, for that kind of higher data rate. But right now, I'll be thinking of stream gauges, weather stations, um, seismic sensors, um, profiling activities, sounding things. The G5 uh, time series data is actually. Yeah. Um, the one, low rate. Yeah, the low rate data. Yeah. Yeah, you could. That that's an area that we could we could look into. Yeah, this is um data from the G five from from Orcas. Okay. So so the, the reason there are gaps is because the, the aircraft flies on certain days and others. So, but uh, but the but one of our scientists here is, is accessing the, the real time uh, time series data from the G five for his um, algorithms and plots actually during this field program that we have going on right now. And, and and this is a little bit bogus. Um, I didn't have time to organize this. This is all 102 variables that are coming down, which I really need to break up into inst different instruments. Um, right now, having to pick one of these guys out um, doesn't make sense. But uh, you know, it's an example of um, it's been great to demonstrate how easy it is to get to fork data from other sources and bring it in here. So um, I I didn't have access to write software that runs on the aircraft on our G5, but I knew where the database was here, so I wrote a little script which queries the database. It gets triggered by the database on the ground and puts data into this instance. And so we've, we've added um, you know, a bunch of different instruments um, and, and projects, set up portals for them. Steve? And, and of course, I mean, with, with our flux stations, of course, we could be pushing the derived flux. Absolutely. Every half hour, or half five minutes or right. whatever. Yeah, and actually, um, we've talked to Gordon about um, putting a, um, a cords hook in the NIDUS, which would be really trivial to do. It's a really dumb question. It's really exciting, by the way. Um, right. What's preventing, I'm a non-CS person, the um, ex scaling of this to, the, to a um, cloud-based archive to the, oh. if this is all in the cloud, you've got terabytes of Amazon. Store. Yeah, what, what's development time. Yeah, just, just staff, you know. Oh, staff. Okay, so there's nothing technical. No, not at all. No, and and we keep hearing that that um, they want archive as well. You know, it, it was really designed as a communication scheme that let people get real time uh, observations out and out to the world on the internet easily. And uh, they're saying, yeah, we want that, and we would like archiving. So um, that's that's something we'd like to put in, but it's beyond the scope of the current project. Are there constraints in like the time so that can I put in say? an hour of forecast or a day of forecast, and then as I put in real data, 
compare it to the forecast? Or? So um, absolutely, you could. If you look at this, um, well, this is this is not a good example. If if you just send a data without a timestamp, it gets stamped with the time of that that it received it. Um, but you can add a timestamp, and um, I'm going to show you that that field. So the point is that you can put data in after the fact, or or before the fact. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, that's right. Yeah, I guess this one's not doing that either. Um, yeah, let's go to the URLs. Oh, that one's not going to let me do that. <laughs> yeah, I, remember, I remember seeing yeah. that, that you can specify the time, but I'm just thinking that, that it wouldn't block you from putting in something that's before the real, the current time. That's right, no. No, you can specify the time forward or back. It doesn't matter. It just goes in the database with that timestamp. That's a good question. Is, is there a few NSF initiative tools? Well, yeah. not it's the uh, NSF Geosciences, Geosciences. Director. Is anyone else other the directorates using it? Uh, directorates under Geo only. Oh, only yeah. Geo. So I, I heard mention of OGC standards, sensor ML, and the suite. Sweet. Uh, how exactly is that used here? The sensor ML. Click on the sensor ML button up there. More. <laughs> right here, the top, third line down. All right, here, yeah. Sensor ML is the main. Yeah. And, um, and actually, I mean, you can look at that if you want, but um, actually this uh, is connected to the to, to a UAH um, uh, server that handles some of the OGC uh, information, but we haven't expanded that very much. I think what, what we found in this project is, you know, kind of you know, developing this concept, we got a lot of uh, users interested in sending their data to it. And so we configured the portals, we made that very streamlined. Um, we, we tested the implementation on a variety of different kinds of sensors, so that really took most of the uh, most of the time of the proposal. Um, but we have connected the, our streams to, to some of the UAH um, OVC SWE. It's a full SWE implementation, SWE 2.0, right? Yeah, that and th and there, there's really a lot of promise there. That's one of the distinguishing features for us is that we we want to develop that more to where um, a hydrologist can bring up a portal, easily put their data into it and say, I can also get it out to all of these other bigger services that I know nothing about, you know. Um, we're not there yet, but that's that's one of our goals. Okay, yeah. One last question. Yeah, there's a follow up on that. Uh, how much of the richness uh, query um, through the OGC services has been surfaced through the REST gen interface? Is there any slice and uh, slices of time? So this is um, is really the front end, and would be feeding systems that have that capability. It's not built into this capability, and we really wanted to have something that's simple, that's really comprehensible for the small researcher, and then the ability for it to couple seamlessly to bigger, more um, capable systems. That actually brings us right to the architecture. Uh, how do I get on? Oops. <laughs> Okay, so um, yeah, and that, that you, you've, you've hit on the architecture you know, for the cord system, and um, as you, you can see, the, all the portals on the on the left. So these are the things that the instrumentations teams primarily would be focused on, making sure their measurements are coming in, the assessing the quality. It's really common for those groups to download CSV files, you know, to do some processing. Um, but then those are connected to more advanced services, uh, you know, just the, just via the URLs that uh, Charlie talked about. Um, you know, for processing, translation, mapping, visualization, and then um, the, the whole set of EarthQ billing blocks would follow some of these OGC standards. So you're, what you're seeing today is just the left side of this graph. Um, but really, we have to get the data in order for the for these downstream things you know, to happen. And we really wanted to prove that uh, this you know, that a general concept could apply in lots of different kinds of sensors. Um, but that's certainly a, a development. Uh, uh, that we w want to uh, pursue in the in the future. And thanks for that question. That's good. 
Um, here's an example of, uh, I did talk about the fact that we were putting our, our data into the OGC uh, SWE uh, implementation by the UAH group, and, and uh, you can hardly see it, but um, you'll, you'll be able to see some of the um, water gauges uh, overlaid with radar data. This is the Geo Explorer application that you may have heard of uh, that follows those standards. So um, I think the next question uh, that we get asked is why should NCAR you know, be involved in this? Um, I'd say, you know, at a much, much smaller scale, um, we can develop services that are agnostic to the types of data, just like the FTP. It can be documents, it can be data, it can be images. Um, and so, you know, we feel that we can uh, develop an, a, a system that's agnostic to the type, type of data that's applicable to our data and, and the broader geosciences um, that's of benefit to us. Um, <clears throat> we can, by being involved in this development, we can shape you know what it looks like, and um, you know make sure that we have some of our requirements uh, into that uh, um, uh, system development. Um, this also makes it easier for our, our scientists and engineers at NCAR to access our data. Right now, the, there's a range of, of ways to do that. Uh, some require database expertise. Um, some uh, have, have other uh, software that you just download. So we really wanted to target this very simple approach of just URLs you know, to, to get access to the data. So it, it makes those data more accessible to NCAR scientists and engineers here. And then... Um, you know, this will this will be a way for us to gain awareness of other uh, operational systems as we do these field experiments in EOL, for example. Um, it's it's very common for us to tap into existing mesonets that are sampling uh, data, so this will give us some exposure to maybe these uh, these networks of uh, sensors that we didn't know about um, through, the, but they're using cords, the, you know, for example. And then. Um, there are very common uh, challenges uh, in terms of de deploying sensors around the world, for especially with communications and and uh, you know, things like that, signal processing. And so this kind of builds this network of uh, scientists and engineers that are that are doing that that we can tap into and they can tap into us, you know, for for actual deployments. And then um, what we really learned a lot about during this project is experience in, in how to deploy software uh, in the cloud and actually uh, the advances that have been made in visualization through a web browser. That was something we, uh, w that uh, Gordon had uh, dabbled in uh, at, at about the same time that, that uh, this project came up. But this is going to prove to be a very valuable uh, tool and, and, and skill set for our future displays. And I really think this is a development that's appropriate for a national center. We're, um, you know, we're really focused on real-time uh, measurements. Uh, th th that's not uh, uh, uncommon within the geosciences community, and so it's something we can share and lead uh, the community in. So I have some, that's my presentation. So I just have some uh, questions that I'd like to pose uh, to the group, especially uh, you know, providers and consumers of, of, of real-time data. But um, what are some other sources of real-time data that we might uh, need or might be useful for, for field experiments? Jeff? <laughs> and Dan? I, I would be happy to work with you in getting MOPA data there you go. Uh, in, in there. But I, uh, I, I think that um, because because MAPA data is uh, not really point source or points, I was thinking about using this as a way of tracking file names and, and mm -hmm. so that there'd be a time series of our granules. People would find that those and then that would create uh, FTP uh, uh, locations. That's similar to the use case that the NOAA fellow t asked us about, right, with the radar data? Uh, come in. Yeah, that's a good, good one. Great. That's a great. Other ideas? I'll give you one. Good. Uh, what about if you've got these sensors in various parts of the world, you'd like to co locate data that would be comparable in space and time, okay. such yeah. as, for example, radar data that was co located with the precipitation gauge? Nice. The precipitation gauge is in your network, but the radar data is also accessible. But you, you want to be able to tie a specific piece of radar data to that geographical location in, in time. Nice, uh, yeah. So you come up with a way of, of doing that would benefit both sensors. Right, right. Good one. That, that sounds like sort of an OGC function. It does, yeah. 
Other, Charlie? I just wanted to, I, I forgot to mention that right now we're strictly focused on time series uh, data, but the, a few simple um, data types that I think will give us a lot of leverage would be um, some imagery capability. Um, you could uh, post an image, uh, medium, modern size image every few minutes or something like that. Uh, that would be a common use. And then also some kind of profile or sounding data type is another very common sort of ray type of data. Um, I think people would find very useful as well. Okay. Yeah, we had, uh, oh, sorry, Steve. I was thinking of a, a field experiment that's more like a emergency management situation on demand. And, yeah. You know, could people prepare sources and get it all working, and then if the need arises, you just turn on the switch and you start collecting all the information for an emergency management situation? No, nice. a, yeah. a flooding, a, a big storm like we had yesterday, or, or right. whatever. An instance that would just pop up and then start collecting the data you needed to yeah. further advise decision makers, etc. Great. I was going to say we we um, uh, have interacted with these uh, th some of these small research teams that are operating UAVs, and it's primarily imagery. It's what what I could, at least the pe people we've been talking to, but um, that, that and, and they and they use it for emergency management, for example, Chris. So Great, thanks for that. Um, now on the consumer side, um, you know, I, w one one thing I would mention here is that Mel Shapiro, a scientist here, gave a talk about uh, what what if we could take the aircraft uh, in situ data and feed that into a, a a forecasting model that then predicts in real time where the storm is going to be you know, using using some of those data. It was an interesting concept, and of course. Some of the some of the uh, constraints were uh, in in getting access to the data, but this might open the door for something like that. What are some other scientific needs for um, de algorithm development or models? Uh, I'm real, real curious what people think. Uh, you have some, Chris. Okay. Draw a box. Right. Oh, nice. Okay. Sorry. To expand on that, Chris, we've gotten an inquiry from uh, Terry Eastburn. Terry Eastburn, uh, STEM C, and um, with the idea that courts can be a um, part of a K through 12 uh, science outreach project, and um, it provides uh, that component, <coughs> which would be uh, cloud and computer science and web technologies that would be just perfect fit for high school students. Wait, and we and we were uh, partnering with this uh, 3D printed weather station group, for example, so that they the, the school could get involved in the design and the printing, you know, 3D printing at the school, you know, connect a Raspberry Pi up to it, and then then have the data, you know, analyze the data with something like Quartz, yeah, you know, for and example. Yeah, so yeah. it, it, it uh, really expands the horizon for that educational part. Yeah, well, and now that I think about outside of schools and such, um, for one of our projects, we may know that we're going to have a field project somewhere, um, and without knowing the things that are available out there, yeah. potentially go out and put out a query and say, well, again, you know, we want anything that's in this spatial domain, yeah. show us what we can get at. Right, yeah. 
that's a good you know that's what we envision especially with these discoverability of some of these um sources scott you had your head up Any given to oh, mean like an Uber for an uh, in-car shuttle? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but seriously, it'd be like there's commercial applications like this for real-time tracking of buses and airplanes and where they are. Yeah, good. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, and we're getting we're doing a lot of that in our field experiments with the mobile mobile vehicles, for example. Uh, but those data are pretty much in a closed system. Is that right, Eric? Or okay, at this time. Oh, those are great. Thanks. Um, and then I think we touched a little bit on this, but uh, we t you know, what are the other? What are some other um, data sources that were that would be helpful in real time and useful in real time? Imagery uh, was one. We we talked about this notion of um, especially with high volume data, you know, sp finding some way to uh, derive products that would be useful um, to scale it down that in, in a way that could be more manageable. Um, and of course, this is something we do in the in our, in our field projects all the time. Uh, we don't give people the full uh, bandwidth because we can't send it. Um, but any other ideas on, on other types of real-time data we might um, look at? Along those lines, you have power spectrum or spectrum. Yeah, right. Power spectrum, close spectrum. Spatial interpolations and distributed networks. Oh, there you go. For products. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's kind of a slippery slope about getting into the analysis side of things because then you start putting together a, <coughs> a, a cookbook of very specialized things, you know, there's things for some people and other people you don't have a we tried to avoid getting real specialized. I, I think one thing I'd say is uh, perhaps the analysis teams, you know, develop the products. You know, maybe maybe they take the spatial data from the from the cords uh, portals in the area, develop the products, and then those go out through another cords instance. And maybe something like that would work. Yep. Or maybe maybe plugins that they could provide. Well, that's a good idea with, with an open source. Yeah. yeah. I, I I think you have to think a real time a little bit different perspective, and that is that a lot of the things that we're trying to do in meteorology is we're trying to forecast what's going to happen in a specific place and uh, you're talking about real-time data if I can access the forecast for the time that is now from different models I can see which model is is providing me with the most accurate result yeah. and that's just a lookup sort of thing and you know you've got things like weather stations and or aircraft or whatever, but they're, they're, geogra they're ge geographically spaced and they're sampling at a, at a given time a real variable. Right. And you want to be able to compare that with, with the model. very model, with different kinds of model output to see which model is, is, is producing the, the right output. And so this right. kind of a, a structure lends itself to being able to do that for a variety of different locations that, that might be really useful. Uh, if you do it for one location, and one model, you can do it easily for a dozen locations. Right. Common interface. Yep, Dan? Uh, you, know, you had that comment to that, uh, the 25 hertz uh, uh, observations. I was thinking of maybe that if there's a time series that's very high s uh, temporal resolution, that you could do like a Fourier transform, break it into components, and just store the components. And then that way you have sort of a, a time series at a much lower temporal steps. Mm, that's a good idea. The, the high, high sampling rates. That's what they did with the BAO two decades ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 well, they, they're limited by storing data on how yeah. they some correlations. Very disparate data sets. Looking yeah. Geosciences. Uh, yeah. Science that's a great example. Yeah. I think these are great ideas about how we distinguish ourselves from the Internet of Things. Yeah, right. The types of things we're trying to do with that data are quite different. Those are great. All right, thanks so much for that feedback. Um,
that's all I had uh, you know, for the presentation. Uh, check out cordsrt.com and uh, uh, here's the email address for the for the team if you have uh, further questions. And I really appreciate your your suggestions and uh, and thanks for being here. Thanks.